you can be thousand times bigger on the inside than you are on the outside man is made up of three parts we have spirit soul body now the spirit of man makes him conscious of the eternal realm the realm of spirits whether the divine side or the demonic side you will use your spirit to be conscious but when we see somebody is dead in spirit it doesn't mean that the spirit has ceased to function what it means that the spirit is dead to god the soul makes man conscious of himself then your body makes you conscious of the physical environment Father, we thank you this morning for this privilege you've given us to come and sit at your feet. Even as your word is coming, we pray that you will help us, Lord, to open our hearts to receive your word. Let your word transform us and let your word lead us into our destiny we thank you and we bless you in jesus name amen hallelujah you may be seated we thank god for today and uh, you are welcome to church this morning today is 20th august 2017 and i'm speaking on what i call mind your spirit mind your spirit and i'm going to be talking about mind your spirit mind your tongue mind your body mind your mind so today is mind your spirit so God wants us to be very um, particular about spiritual development. Spiritual development is very important. Just as we have physical development and somebody can develop the body and bring out the muscles that are in the body to the extent that when you look at the person and you compare the person to the average human being, you will see that this person is bigger or more muscular, what we call macho. The the muscles that the macho men have, the muscle, you, you also have the same muscles. It's the same muscles that we all have. But by reason of constant workout, they have been able to develop those muscles. Those muscles were not attached to them. They were not decorated with them. They were in them. But by reason of constant workout, those muscles came out. And so they became macho men. And when we see their bodies, we know that there's a story behind what you are seeing. Days and years sometimes of going to the gym, working out, pain unless the the muscle uh burst it will not it will not grow so when you go to the gym one popular um um ideology in the gym is no pain no gain so when your when your gym instructor gives you the number of reps that you must go that you must lift this this um maybe a dumbbell or you know when you when you're doing bench so this is the which you must you must press or you must lift and you must do it 15 reps 15 reps so you lift it one two three 15 times and the reason why they do that is that by the time you get to the 15th you see that the your muscle is tensed and it's supposed to burst so that 
the muzzle becomes enlarged. Now, when it comes to the spiritual side, it is just like that. You can be thousand times bigger on the inside than you are on the outside. In terms of potency, you can be thousand times more potent on the inside. You can be thousand times larger on the inside than you are on the outside. And we've had uh, physical giants and mental giants. And God is also interested in raising spiritual giants. People who are developed spiritually. Now, man has a threefold nature, just as we all know. And it's because God is also a triune being. God is triune, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And God created man in his own image. So man must of necessity be triune. So man is made up of three parts. We have spirit, soul, body. Now let's come to First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Let me let me read that quickly. It says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. And the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he said that may your whole spirit, soul, body. That is, these are the three main, three main parts of man. Spirit, soul, body. And it is in that order. It is not body, soul, spirit. It is spirit, soul, body. God is very particular about order. You know, the order in which these things appear. We should not change the order. Now, so, and God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Let him have dominion. Genesis 1, 26, going to 28. So when God created man in his image, the man became triune. God created man as a spirit. Then, uh, 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 then God also made our bodies from the dust of the earth. You know, and then when the spirit and the body came together, the soul was formed. Now the spirit of man makes him conscious of the eternal realm. The realm of spirits. Spirits are eternal. Spirits are not, spirits don't die. You know, and it is your spirit that makes you conscious of the eternal realm. Whether the divine side or the demonic side, you will use your spirit to be conscious. When we say somebody is dead in spirit, it doesn't mean that the spirit has ceased to function. What it means is that the spirit is dead to God. Somebody can be an unbeliever, but the spirit can be very alive. But, but not to God, but to the devil. So when we say spiritual death, it doesn't mean that your spirit is dead literally. It means your spirit is separated from God. You know, then the soul makes man conscious of himself. So the soul is always self-centered. It makes you conscious of yourself. The, what would, what would distinguish between you and the other person who carries your name? What will let you know that you are called Kwesi and this person is also called Kwesi, but you are different. It's your soul. Your soul makes you conscious of your, of your, um, uh, of yourself. And then your soul also helps you to contact the mental realm. The, 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 the soul is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotions. I'll talk about that. Then your body makes you conscious of the physical environment. So your body makes you conscious of the world around you. The world around you. So it is, that's God's order. Spirit, soul, body. The spirit was created to be the leader. The soul was created to be an agent. And the body was created to be a servant. It is in that order. The leader, the agent, and the servant. When the body becomes the leader, um, then you are in trouble. When the body becomes, it means that you have reversed God's order. The result is chaos, confusion, and darkness. When the body becomes the leader, the leader is a spirit, and the agent is a soul. So the spirit controls the body through the soul. The spirit controls the body through the soul. The spirit controls and directs the body through the soul. The only exception is when it gets to the, the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, when you are speaking in tongues, that is where, that, that, that's the only exception. 
when it comes to that, the spirit controls the body directly. Because when you speak in tongues, you know, there is a spirit and the body, the tongue, and the mind is unfruitful. It doesn't pass through the soul. So that is God's order. Now, when man sinned, that, that order of God was disturbed. So the body became the leader and the spirit became the servant. And the soul was still the agent. So when man sinned, man's basic essential nature was fleshly. Before Adam sinned, his essential nature was spiritual. Spirit. That is why he was naked and not even conscious of his nakedness. By the moment they sinned, their essential nature became fleshly. So in Genesis 6-3, God said, My spirit will not strive with man forever, for he is flesh. When you read um, um, other verses, he has become flesh. He has become flesh. Why? Because the spirit now is trapped. The spirit is not the leader anymore. It is now being led by the body. Even as believers, when we come born again, we can also be led by the body. The believer who is led by the body is what we call a carnal believer. The carnal Christian, he is ruled by the body, body ruled. Then the believer who is led by the soul is also called the soulish Christian. Soulish Christian. Sukikus. Sukikus. Soulish Christian. Soulless Christian, you know, soulless Christian. Then the believer who is ruled by the spirit is a spiritual man. Pneumaticus, spiritual man. Pneumaticus. So, so, Sukikus and Sakikus. Sakikus is the one who is ruled by the body, the carnal believer. Okay. Now, so when man sinned, the spirit of man became a servant and the spirit was trapped. In fact, now our spirits are trapped in our bodies and our spirits want to get out. I'll, I'll show you. So now we call the spirit the hidden man. In First Peter 3, 3 to 4, Peter said that let, let not your adorning be merely outward, but rather the hidden man of the heart. The hidden man, hidden person, referring to the spirit now. The spirit is a hidden man. The, the Greek is the kryptos man. Kryptos meaning hidden. Hidden. You know, hidden. In Ephesians 3.16, the Bible talks about the inner man. That he may grant that he may be strengthened with might in your inner man by, by his spirit. Strengthened with might in your inner man. So the spirit is called the inner man. Inner. He's, he's inside, trapped in the body, inner man. Then in 2 Corinthians 4.16, he said, Though our outward man perishes, yet our inward man is renewed from, for, uh, from day to day. Though our outward man perishes, yet our inward man, so the spirit is also called the inward man. All these terms are indicating that the spirit is trapped inside. There's a man inside. You know, and there's a man outside. The body is the outward man. That is what everybody sees. But the spirit is the inward man. Then the last one, John 7, 38, he said, He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his innermost being, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Other version says, out of his belly, belly, or heart, or innermost being. Referring to the spirit, the innermost being. So the spirit is trapped in the body and the spirit is groaning, groaning to be released from the body. As a matter of fact, a time will come when the spirit will be released from the body. When Jesus comes, this body, see, this body we have now has been sold under death. It is mortal. Mortal means death doomed. When Jesus comes and we see him, our bodies are going to be changed. We are going to have transfigured bodies. That is when our spirits will be truly free. Free to express itself. Because right now, the kind of stuff that God has deposited in the spirit is so great and powerful that 
The body is restricting the spirit. There are a lot of things that God has placed in the spirit, but our bodies, because our bodies still, our bodies are limited by time and space. Our bodies are limited, you know, by sickness and by death and all that. But when this body changes, and read, let's read Romans 8.23. That was what the Bible was uh, trying to say. Romans 8.23. It says, verse 22, For we know that the whole Christian grows and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption. The redemption of our body. When the body is redeemed, that's the, that is when our spirits will enter into the glorious liberty, you know, and, and, and right now it is trapped. It is trapped. But we are waiting for that time. So when that time comes, we will have spirits that have been translated, souls that have been transformed, and bodies that have been transfigured. That is going to be God's ultimate, you know, the, the, the finality of God's plan for man. A translator spirit with a transformed mind in a transfigured body. Then that is when the world will truly know who we are. In 1 John 3, he said that now it does not yet appear what we are. But when we see him, we shall be like him. That is when we will know that we are really like him. Now we are like him in the spirit, but the spirit is trapped. It's trapped. Now, the spirit is made up of three parts. The soul is made up of three parts. The body made up of three parts. Three, three, three. You see, because God is triune and man was created in the image of God. The spirit has three parts. One part is called the conscience. Then, the second part is called the intuition. And the third part is called the fellowship. Fellowship, the part that helps in fellowshipping with spirits. Then the soul has three parts. The mind, the will, and the emotions. That's these, these three parts make the soul. And of these three parts, the mind is the leader. The mind is a leader. It is the will that decides. The mind decides, but it's the will that carries out. You know, when, when it gets to the will, it becomes an intent. The mind will have the thoughts and the will will have the intent. Then the emotions will have the manifestation. So Bible says the soul that sins shall die. It's a soul that sins. That's where the will is. Then the body too has three parts. The flesh the blood and the bones. So these are the three parts of your body. You are, you are, you either have the flesh, the, the blood and the bones. You remember when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, his body did not have blood. He said, you see that it is I for a, a spirit does not have flesh and bones such as I have. So he had only flesh and bones. And Ephesians 5.30 says, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Amen. But we are talking about the spirit today. Now, the conscious part of the spirit is a part that deals with moral issues. It gives indication of right or wrong. Like, it's like, the conscience is like a traffic light. Okay, for traffic light, you have red, gold, green. But for the conscience, it's just red and green. Right or wrong? Go, don't go. Do, don't do. And that is what helps you to decide or distinguish between good and evil. Moral issues is the conscience. When you are born again, your conscience becomes active. Because Hebrews 9.14 will tell you that our conscience is purged by the blood of Jesus. So your conscience becomes active at the new birth. When you are dead in sin and trespasses, you are not born again. Your conscience too is dead. Your conscience is dead. You, 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 you can still have a sense of right and wrong, but there's no benchmark. So what, what is right and wrong becomes relative. 
So people who are not born again will say, according to my conscience, it's not, it's, it's not bad, but it may be bad. The fellowship is the ability that the spirit has to interact with spirits. Interact with spirits. The spirit has the ability to, number one, contact spirit. Number two, contain spirit. Number three, interact with spirit. That's the fellowship part. That's, that, that's why the Holy Spirit can live in us. The Holy Spirit can live in us because of the spirit. That fellowship part. That's why God had to make man in his image so that there will be spirit to spirit connection. Romans 8, 16 says, for the spirit bears witness with our spirit. That is fellowship, contact. He is bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You know, 1 Corinthians 14, 15, 16, this I will do then. I will sing with the spirit and sing with my understanding. I will pray with the spirit and pray with my understanding. I will pray with the spirit first. Then understanding comes. The spirit is always first. I will sing with the spirit first. Then I will sing with understanding. Some people usually pray with understanding first. Then they pray in the, in, in the spirit. When you pray in the spirit, then you interpret in understanding. You get the word of God through the words that come with understanding. Then the, 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 the next part of the spirit is the intuition. The intuition is what we call the spirit's ability to know. You know, if there was something like a Noah, K-N-O-W-E-R, a Noah, I'm just coining that word, a Noah. A Noah, maybe something that knows is a spirit, is in the spirit. We call it intuition. You just know it. You just know. It is not knowledge that comes from the five senses. You see, God never designed man to live to, 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 to be dictated to by the five senses. As a matter of fact, Adam, Adam was led by the Spirit of God. By the Spirit of God. So, for, for Adam, knowledge came from God. It didn't come through the five senses. It was after man fell that man began to learn from outside to inside. But before man fell, man was learning from inside to outside. In other words, God was releasing knowledge into the spirit of man. That is what we call inspiration. He was breathing into man and man was getting understanding and man was using the understanding of God to set the standard on this earth. So Adam and God had a spirit-to-spirit relationship where they could communicate. You see, there's, 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 there's a spiritual communication that is higher than our physical communication. Yes. When you go to heaven, you will not need to open your mouth to speak for somebody to hear. There's a heart-to-heart communication where I know instantly what you are thinking and you know instantly what I'm thinking. And we are communicating, but we are not using words. That is, that is how God wants to lead us. In fact, one of the blessings of the New Testament is this thing. Where God leads us from the inside. Where he leads us by speaking to our spirits. Because see, the spirit is the main person. And he is the target. He is God's target. When you go to somebody's house, you don't talk to the house. You talk to the person. So your body is your house. You are the one living in your body. And you are the spirit. The real you is the spirit that is living in the body. And so God targets you. When God is speaking to you, God will speak to your spirit. So the voice of God, first of all, is heard in your spirit. He moves you in your spirit. We call it the inward witness. Either through the conscience, through fellowship, or through intuition, spiritual knowledge that you you didn't learn from outside. It is revelation, revelation knowledge. That is how God wanted to lead man. When man fell, 
God had to come down to man's level to reveal himself to man. And that is why we even got the Bible. You see, so that man can now read. When man reads, man can know what God is thinking, what God wants to say. So God was relating to man on man's level because we had come down from that ability to receive God's voice in our Noah, our spirit. So he came down to man's level, but that was not God's intention. That was not God's first, first option. God's first option was to be speaking directly to your spirit so that he will direct you. So now what God has done is that God has given the Bible as a general principle of his purposes, his plans, his will, his desires, his, his counsel. So the Bible becomes the benchmark or the boundary, the boundary. But God will speak to you in your spirit and give you direction. But you see, the direction that God gives you will never contradict the, the Bible. The Bible is the boundary. It's like this. Let's imagine you have a cow or let's say a sheep. A cow is too big. A sheep. Then you, 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 you know, you've teetered it to a tree. There's a rope around the, the sheep. Then the rope is tied to a tree. The sheep is free to roam or move about in a, in the radius as far as the length of the rope will permit him. He cannot go beyond the rope. But within that radius, he can just move. Now, the tree is the Bible. It's the Bible, the word of God. This Bible, the written word. But our freedom is this. For as long as the, what the spirit, what we are hearing does not contradict the Bible, it could be from the spirit of God. It will, it should never contradict. There are certain things God may tell you, they may not be in the Bible, black and white, but they will not contradict because it's not in the Bible that you should marry this person or that person. Are you getting me now? It's not written in the Bible that you should um, do this or that. Even the ministry that God has given you, it's not written in the Bible. So God will speak to you, your spirit, but what God will speak to you will not contradict the written word. The written word becomes the benchmark, the boundary. But the spirit still remains God's first point of call. That he will speak to you through the spirit. Now come to Hebrews 8. Look at one of the blessings of the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 8. God, God wanted to go back to the Garden of Eden where Man was walking. You see, Adam didn't have, didn't follow a book per se. There was no book like the Bible. But Adam was doing God's will. Why? Because there's a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty gives him understanding. So God will breathe into Adam and Adam will get an understanding. He will get a revelation of God's will. And then Adam will begin to name the animals and say, you, you are a sheep. And that would be a reflection of what was on God's heart. He didn't need to go to a book to consult and to find out. It was a direct relationship. Hebrews 8 verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. But because, because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, in their mind, and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. 
For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. This is the kind of covenant that we are under in the New Testament. And God is saying that in this New Testament, I'm going to write the laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. So actually, everything in the Bible is already in our spirits. Already in us. Everything. Already in us. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't need to read the Bible anymore. What I mean is that the spirit, the spirit of the, 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 the word is in us. You see, the, the Bible is the written word, but the living word himself is in us. And that is the blessing of the New Testament. That our spirits contain God's counsel, God's purposes, God's desires, God's will, everything. It is in our spirit. But we need to be able to tap into that reservoir or that storehouse for what has already been worked into us to be worked out. That is all. But everything has been worked into the spirit. He said, I've written my laws in their mind. He said, nobody shall teach that that no God. He said, you shall know God. You see, because knowing God is intuition. You, we can't teach you to know God. You can't prove God in a lab. You can't prove God in a test tube like you do titration. You can't do that. You can't say this plus that, therefore God. No. You can only know God in an intuitive way. That's why we all know, we all know God. We all know that God is there. No, nobody, nobody taught you. You knew. It is intuition. Intuition. Now, the spirit of man is God's first point of call. The first point of call. When God is dealing with man, the first point is the spirit. The spirit is what God deals with. When God is dealing with, with man. Do you know why the spirit was created first? Because the spirit is the foundation of man. The spirit was created first. Come to Job chapter 10. Job was describing how God created him. Job 10. And he gives a very nice description of how it, it, it will help us to understand Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Job 10, verse 9. Remember, I pray that you have made me like clay, and will you turn me into dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk, and kettle me like cheese, clothe me with skin and flesh, and knit me together with bones and sinews? Who, who is the me here? The me is the spirit. The real man. He said, you, you poured me out like milk. Poured into what? Kettle me like cheese. And you clothed me with skin. That is the, 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 the body, the flesh that God was putting around the spirit. So it's the same thing that God did in Adam's life. He said, and the Lord God formed the body of man out of the dust of the earth breathe into him the breath of life, the spirit. And man became a living soul. When the spirit entered that clay, that mold that God had made, blood came. You see, your, your soul, your soul is in the blood. That's why in Leviticus 7, 17, 11, it said that uh, the, 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 the life of the animal is in the blood. The soul of the animal is in the blood. So when God breathed into your body, then blood came into your body. That's the soul. Then your body became a living soul. Man became a living soul. So the soul was when the, the spirit and the body came together. So God, the, the spirit is always God's first point of call. 
the point of first call. God's first point of call is the, is the spirit. Why? Because the spirit is, is a foundation. We don't see foundations, but they carry the entire building. So spiritual development is the most important of all the three parts of man. The spirit is the most important. The spirit, the soul is the second most important. The body is the third most important. All of them are important. In fact, all of them are most important, but we have the first most important, second most important, third most important. Spirit, soul, body. So, that's why God begins his work always from the spirit. Because that is the real you. That is the most important. That is why any work that God will do, the target is the spirit. He said, the axe is laid at the roots of the tree. Not the fruits or the leaves, but the roots, the foundation. What, when God is, God is doing a work among men, God goes straight to the spirit. He targets the foundation. So, if any man be in Christ Jesus, is a new creation, all old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That scripture, 2 Corinthians 5.17, was talking about the spirit, not the body. When you become born again, your body doesn't change. Your height doesn't reduce or increase. Your complexion doesn't change. You are your same body. So when he says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. That any man is the inner man, spirit, spirit man, the cryptos man, the inward man. He is the one who is a new creation. All that God did during the, um, in the process of the new birth, everything that God did, it was targeted at the spirit. All that he did, watching us, you know, with the blood of Jesus Christ, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, that it was the Spirit. The Spirit. We were crucified with Him, buried with Him, we were raised up with Him, made to sit together with Him, far above all principality and power, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in the world to come. All that are things that God has done in the Spirit, in our spirit. It is your spirit that is seated with Christ in heavenly places. It is your spirit. You see, dominion was given to Adam when he was spirit. When God created man and said, let us make man, let him have dominion. And so God created man. And then God gave man dominion. That was before his body was formed in Genesis 2, 7. So, dominion belongs to the spirit man. Why? Because the spirit is the leader. Is the leader. That's why all that God will do is the target is the spirit. Do you know something? All of God's treasures for man are locked up in his spirit. Every treasure of God that he has for man, he deposited it in the spirit. In the spirit. Every treasure, virtues of God, healing virtue, prosperity, power, wisdom, whatever. You see, when you become born again, everything that God wants to give you, he places in your spirit. Everything. If you, if you study how God is and how he operates, you understand. God went to the earth and created man's body. He never went to the earth again. And we have billions of bodies. So, from that one body that he formed from the earth, billions came. That is, that is how God thinks. So, when God called you, everything about you was worked into your spirit. Everything. Look at how God created this earth. He stuffed the earth with all that we would need. All the minerals, all the oil, everything is on this earth. We have never had to go to Mars or Jupiter to borrow anything from them. I don't know whether there are people there, but we have never had to go outside the earth. That's how God thinks. 
So the day you became born again, everything was in your spirit. Every anointing you will need is in the spirit. Prosperity, everything. All that Jesus did for you, it was worked into your spirit. So there is not a single believer who can say that I am not anointed. I don't have power. I'm not prosperous. I don't have wisdom. Healing was what into your spirit. What, what, what we need is for some keys to unlock. That's all. Keys to unlock. That's all. That is what we need. Keys to unlock. I'll talk about that. Do you know the awesome treasure we have in us? Second Corinthians 4, 7. For we have this awesome treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence may be of God, not of us. Awesome treasure in earthen vessels. What is the awesome treasure? The awesome treasure is deposited in our spirit. Because the awesome treasure is spiritual and it's in our spirit. So we work about carrying awesome treasure. So awesome. So awesome. I can't even begin to unravel, you know, the awesome, to go into the awesomeness of the treasure. In 1 John 3, 9, he said, whoever is born of God has the seed of God abiding in him. That treasure is also called seed of God. Seed of God. Do you know what a seed is? A seed is a carrier of life. A seed is a, is a carrier of life. A seed is the hope of the future. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The seed of God. You see, when you see a seed, it means that life will go on. Do you understand? So if you eat a fruit without a fruit with no seeds, it, it, it means that the fruit, that's the end of the fruit. But when there are seeds in the fruit, it means life goes on. Because the seed is the unit of life. That is what will ensure that life continues. I said the seed of God lives in us, containing the life of God, the DNA of God, the nature of God, the power of God, everything of God wrapped in a seed put in us. We carry that awesome treasure. First John 4.4 4, He said, greater is he that is in you, than he that is in the world. That greater one is in us. Where is he? In our spirit. In our spirit. I'm telling you, we need to begin to major on the inside. Mind your spirit. We have not been minding our spirit. I'm telling you that if we mind our spirits and we are able to unlock this awesome treasure, the whole earth cannot, the, the earth will be too small to, you see, the earth is too small to contain this treasure. We need eternity. Yeah. We need eternity to be able to fully express what has been deposited in us. That's why this earth will not last forever. We can only express just so much. But to fully express all that God has witnessed to us, we will need eternity. That's why I said that our body is a hindrance to the awesome treasure, the spirit wants to be released. So when the body is transfigured, you will see that the spirit will be fully released. Fully released. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That that treasure is Christ. Christ in us. Christ in us. That's the mystery. You see, the, the mystery that... Paul said, God called him to preach. That mystery, which was hidden in, in, in ages past, but was revealed to the, the servants of God, that mystery is Christ in you. That now, God has put something on the inside of man. Christ. Christ. God put gold in the Garden of Eden. The enemy came to steal the gold. Then God said, now I will put Eden in man. The gold is now in the spirit. Because Eden is now in the spirit. Eden is in the spirit. 
Where God lives, the presence of God is in the spirit. Hello. Let me read Colossians 2, 3. Colossians 2, 3. If you are a student, listen to this carefully. I'm reading. It says, talking about Jesus, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures. Hidden where? In Christ. Where is Christ? Christ in you. The hope. Hope means the seed. The expectation. You know, so Christ in you, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, the second thing is that God's blueprint for our lives, they have already been worked into our spirits. Hello? God's blueprints, when I say blueprints, God's original purpose, plan for your life, everything has been worked into your spirit. Where you have to be, who you should meet, who you should marry, where you have to work, where you have to stay, what ministry you have to do. Everything has already been worked into your spirit. So, God, you see, God is a wise God. So, whatever dealings that God has with you, it will be just giving you some keys to unlock that treasure. But that thing is in your spirit. Yeah. Come to 1 Corinthians 2.11. Let me show you something. Then we will also read um, Ephesians 2.10. 1 Corinthians 2.11. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. It says, For what man knows the things of a man Except the spirit of the man which is in him. Who knows your destiny better than you? That's what he's saying. He's saying that, is there any man who knows your destiny better than the spirit that is in you? He said, who knows the things of a man more than the spirit that is, that is in the man? Nobody knows God's plan for your life better than you. Why? Because it is in you. Sometimes, because we, we listen, it's like this. It's like a, 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 a gadget that has a secret code. The gadget has a secret code. And that secret code, the code matches with the gadget. Because it has been encoded in the gadget. So you have to decode it. So whatever, let me read Ephesians 2.10. That is why if you are a believer, you should not panic. You should not be afraid. You should not be afraid for the future. Afraid of the future. You don't live in anxiety. Jesus, Jesus Christ said, he said, take no thought of tomorrow. Because, see, everything has been worked into you. Everything. God is not doing anything from outside. Sometimes we say, we are praying for the Holy Ghost baptism. We think he's coming from heaven. He's not coming from heaven. The Holy Ghost came from heaven on the day of Pentecost. He has not returned. He is right with us on earth here. So in the Bible, what you do is that you receive the Holy Ghost. Not that he gives the Holy Ghost. You receive him. He has already given him. He gave him out on the day of Pentecost when he came on this earth. And he has been here and he will be here till the, the, church, the church is raptured. So when we say impartation, we are not bringing something from heaven. The Holy Spirit is already here. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. 
God is not bringing something from outside. God is it any impartation is targeted at the spirit. It's a key that God will give you to unlock that portion of the spirit that contains that treasure for it to be released. It's in you. Ephesians 2.10 For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Good works. Prepared when? Beforehand. What is beforehand? Before, you see, what is beforehand? Before creation. Before God used his hand to form. Before creation. Before, before, before. It, it was prepared in eternity past that we should walk in them. Now, those things have been encoded in your spirit. If you mind your spirit, you'll be walking in prepared places. It's like this. Bible says, teach a child the way he should go. And when he grows, he will not depart from it. Let me ask you a question. Who determines the way a child should grow? Should go? Who determines it? Who det- he said, train up a child. Don't train him down. Train him up. <laughs> In a way that he should go. Now, sometimes we think that it is the parent who determines the way the child should go. It's not true. It is God. What he's saying is that the child is coming as a unique package with some encodings. You see? Now, every child has a bench. There are some children God has encoded there to bend towards the arts. They are art students. They are not science students. There are some children who are science. Their bent is towards the sciences. There are some, their bent is towards the, the, the thing we use our hands to do. So you, the teacher or the, the parent, he said, train up the child in the way he has been programmed by God to go. And when you put him on that path, you will not depart from it. It's the same way. When you were coming to this world, you were programmed to go a certain direction. When you became born again, God programmed you to go a certain direction. A certain way of ministry. A certain way of life. What we call what your assignment, whatever. Everything was encoded in your spirit upon the new bed. So if you mind your spirit, you will walk into your destiny. Yes. You will walk because everything has been repaired. I was reading Genesis 24 and I was <laughs> this is a man who had been sent by Abraham to go to Abraham's country to find a wife for Abraham's son Isaac. Now listen, Abraham had left his background for more than 40 years. Because even Isaac got married at 40. So for more than 40 years, Abraham had left his background. Now if you even are in Kumasi here, and you travel for 40 years, by the time you come back, can you easily make out your the, the way to your home? Things would have changed. So, if even Abraham himself was going, it would be difficult for him. How much more this servant who didn't know anything about Abraham's background said, go, the Lord will be with you. And when you go, go and find the the woman from my father's house. (laughs) Don't just go and say that, oh, come. No, go straight to my father's house and go and find the woman. The man went there with ten of his servants, camels, then he, he, he got to a well. Then he said, Oh God of Abraham, let it be that the lady who comes and then I ask her to give me water. And then she wants to say that, Oh, let me first some for your donkeys. Let, let her be the one that you have chosen for my master's son. 
Everything looked like a coincidence. But it wasn't coincidence. It was because Abraham had plugged into God's purpose. And so everything was ordered. The man got to the world. The right time, Rebecca too was coming to the world. And lo and behold, it wasn't Rebecca alone who was coming. She was coming in a group. He said the man got to the world. Then she, he saw the maidens coming. So how was he able to approach Rebecca and ask her the question? Bible says, while he even finished praying that prayer, he saw the maidens coming. And Rebecca was coming. So, did God, you see, was it the man's prayer that God answered? No. It wasn't the man's prayer. He was walking in prepared places. Be, you see, because he had plugged into purpose. So, as soon as he finished praying, Rebecca came. Then he said, can I get water to drink? He said, oh, yes. Let me also f- uh, fetch water for your camels, your donkeys. You know what the man did? Right at that moment, he took the, the necklace and then put it on her. Before he asked her, where is your father's house? Take me to your father's house. I mean, I, I mean, what would have, if it were me, I would have waited and asked her, so who is your father? Then she would say, better was oh, okay. Then I will make sure that the father is related to Abraham. Then I will be sure that it is the right person. But this time, he didn't do that. Why? Everything was set. Everything was set. Everything was set. He didn't need to worry about that. Once the, 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 the lady said, I will fetch. That, that, is, that is how the servant got to know that she was the one. I will fetch water for you. So he, the servant, thought that, oh, God has answered my prayer. Because as soon as I finished praying, the lady came and she said, oh, I will fetch water for you. He didn't know that all that had been ordered. You see, there is somebody who will come into your life who will be prepared to fetch water for you and your donkeys. When you meet somebody who says, I don't have enough for you and your donkey. Don't worry. It means that that it, what it means that that is not the Rebecca. That is not the one that God ordained for you. The one that God has ordained for you. The most important thing is plug into God's purpose. Stay in God's purpose. You will meet the person on the journey. It has been ordained on the journey. Ordained on the journey. I'm telling you, everything that, that must happen to your life for God's plan to come to pass, they have all been set, set like street lights or signposts. So if you are on the path, as you go, you will meet this. You will meet that. You, everything has been prepared. It's all in the spirit. Hallelujah. Now, let me now go to the actual message. How to release that thing that is in the spirit. You know, I had a dream last this week. And in the dream, somebody was teaching. And the person was teaching about the key to possessing your possession. And the only point I had in the dream was read the Bible every day. Then I woke up. Read the Bible every day. That's it. That's what he said. He was teaching about the keys to possess your possession. Then he said, read the Bible every day. And then I didn't get other points. But that is, that is just one point. So it's like this. Let me see that the spirit is like a big storeroom or storehouse with Many doors. Many doors. Like a stadium. Big storehouse with many doors. So, the problem or the challenge is how to get the goodies 
in the storehouse. That is when we need keys. Keys to open the treasure house. Keys to open the treasure house. But you see, one of the most important things we need is this agent that I said, the soul, that agent. That process of bringing that agent into alignment with the spirit. That is a major process that will put us on God's path. That is a major process. Because the mind, who is the leader of the soul, who is the main agent, the mind, the mind will play a role in whether we assess the spirit or not. That's why I say, mind your spirit. Where the mind is set. In Romans 8, 5. Romans 8, 5. It says, For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit, they set their minds. Then when you continue, it says, for to be carnally minded um, is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When you set your mind on the spirit, you give attention to the spirit. You prioritize the spirit and make sure that your attention is on the spirit. He said it is life and peace. The path will be life and peace. It means that what God has encoded into your system will be released. So the mind that is set on the spirit. That's why he said set your affection on things above, not on things beneath. Colossians 3 verse 2. He said, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. He said, set your mind. Set your mind on things above, not on things beneath. So, the mind is the leader of the soul who is the agent, and we must make up our mind. We must set our mind on the spirit. Mind the spirit. If the spirit was a human being, we'll say, attend to him. Attend to the spirit. Mind him. Spiritual things must always be prioritized over physical things. Spiritual things must always carry more importance than physical things. Spiritual treasure must always carry more importance than physical treasure. That is why God made sure the Holy of Holies was decorated with gold. The spirit is the Holy of Holies. The soul is the holy place. The body is the outer court. And God made sure that the Holy of Holies was decorated with gold. You see, that's why in the Holy of Holies, there was an Ark of the Covenant. And there was a mercy seat. And God communed with Moses from the mercy seat. That is where the fellowship, the intuition, and then the conscience is, is the spirit. And so if we mind the spirit and we attend to the spirit, then we'll be able to unlock the treasures that are in the spirit. Because everything that we will need to fulfill the purpose of God is already in our spirit. It's not coming from outside. It's coming from here. Do you know how the, the formula God gave Joshua for prosperity? It, will, it said, meditate on the word. Don't let it depart from your mouth. Yes. Keep them in your heart. He said, my son, pay attention to my words. Incline your ears to my saying. Don't let them depart out of your mouth or uh, your sight. 
Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to all those who find it and health to all their flesh. Is that in the midst of your heart? Because they are life to those who find the mind that is set on the spirit is life and peace. Hello. They are life to those who find it and health to all their flesh. Life to those who find it. Health to all their flesh. If we mind the spirit, if we will attend to our spirit and make it a priority, we are going to walk into the good ways that God beforehand prepared. We will walk into them. Every believer has the fruit of the spirit. Every believer. It is worked into your spirit. It's not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of your born again spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't bear fruit. He is the vine. We are the branches. We are the ones who bear the fruit. Not the Holy Spirit. He is the vine. We are the branches. So our spirits. They, they, is the fruit of your born again spirit. And I'm saying that. That fruit is in every believer because it's only one fruit. But the fruit of the spirit is love, peace, joy. Is it is a ah. So that fruit, but how the fruit will be seen in your life is how this agent called the soul, the mind, is set on the spirit. That's why the master key to unlocking this treasure is understanding. Understanding. Revelation. Is the master key. Understanding is revelation. That's why I say wisdom is the principal thing with all you're getting, get understanding. Because understanding is a master key that can unlock all the treasures hidden in our spirit. Understanding. Do you know that healing is already in your spirit as a believer? Healing is already in your spirit. When the Bible says by his Christ we were healed, who was healed is the spirit. The spirit of a man sustains his infirmity. Yes. So, by his strength, so the healing has been worked into your spirit. But understanding revelation will unravel it, release it. There are many believers who are even healed. But it appears they are not healed. The healing is in them. But it appears that the prayers they didn't work. The healing is already. In, that's why some people can get the word, understanding from the word, and healing will take place in their body. The healing is not coming from outside, it has been worked into their body, their spirit. The understanding is what unlocked the healing. Wisdom has already been worked into our spirit. But understanding will release the wisdom. That's why I say wisdom is the principal thing, but you, you have to get understanding. Solomon prayed for understanding. And God said, you have wisdom. He said, give me a heart, that understanding heart, so I can judge these people. And God said, because you have asked for this thing, <laughs> this principal thing, and not for the life of your enemies or prosperity. He said, I have given you wisdom. It's understanding. It makes a difference in how much fruit we can bear. In Matthew 13, Jesus Christ gave the parable of the sower. And he said, these four soils. The first one was by the wayside. The best of the air went and stole them away. Second one fell on rocky uh, ground. And it didn't have much depth, so it, uh, the, when the sun came out, it, it was scorched, and then it died. Third, third one fell on thorny ground, and when it grew, the thorns choked it, and then it didn't come to fruition. It died. But I said, the fourth one fell on good ground. 
But even on good ground, some were 30, some were 60, some were 100. The difference was understanding revelation. So even on good ground, 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold, the difference will be understanding. The potential is the same, but the manifestation is different. That is why we must grow in understanding. That's the only variable. He said, the one with the good heart, he hears the word and understands it. Then with patience, he brings forth the fruit. The, 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 the first soil, he hears the word, he doesn't understand. So the best of the air come and then they take the word. Satan can steal the word if understanding is not attained. Yes. That's what happened. But the last one, he heard the word, understanding came and the word grew. So understanding is a master key that will unlock that door. The doors. If there's anything we should desire and pray for, it is understanding. Understanding. How does understanding come? God breathing into you. There's a spirit in man and the inspiration of the almighty giveth him understanding. Come to Luke 24 verse 45. Let me show you something. Luke 24 45. Okay. He said, and he opened the understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. This is Jesus Christ after he rose from the dead. Now, Luke did not really show us what he did. All that Luke said was that he opened the understanding. But look at what John, John said. John said in John 20, 22, that he breathed on them. And that was in the that when Jesus rose from the dead, John 20, 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Spirit of God. That was when he opened the understanding. Because there's a, there's a spirit in man and the inspiration, you see, inspiration means breathing. So he, he breathed out on them and they breathed in. The inspiration of the Almighty giveth him understanding. So he breathed into them and their eyes were open. The eyes of their hearts were open. That was when they got understanding. That's why Paul said he prayed for them, Ephesians 1.17, that God may give unto them the spirit of wisdom and revelation, understanding, in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of their understanding may be enlightened, that they may know what is the hope of his calling, and what is the riches of his inheritance among the saints and the exceeding greatness of his power toward those who believe? What was that power? That power, let's, let's read it. Ephesians chapter, um, one, verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. All these things that you may know because the eyes of your understanding have been enlightened. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Come to Ephesians chapter 3. Chapter 3. Verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. So, the understanding that they will receive is what will unlock the power that is in them. So we must pray for understanding. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, he said, be, be children in malice, 
but in understanding be men. He said, be children when it comes to malice, evil, but when it comes to understanding, be men. Because understanding ensures growth. You can read the word. Let me tell you something. You can read the word without understanding. There will be no growth. You can read books. You can spend your time reading books. If God doesn't give you understanding, you will not get anything from it. You can listen to sermons without understanding. Because you see, the word, the sermon, the books, they are the knowledge. But he said that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and understanding in the knowledge of him. So you acquire knowledge, but God gives understanding. It's the spirit of understanding that can take the various pieces of knowledge that you've gotten and piece them together. If there's any prayer to pray, you have to pray for understanding. Daniel fasted for understanding for 21 days. Can you imagine? All his prayer was, Lord, help me to understand the word. The word of prophecy that you spoke to Jeremiah, let me understand the seasons and the times. And he was praying for 21 days. The first day he prayed, God sent the angel to come and bring the understanding. And guess what? The angel of Satan was stood in for 21 days. Why? Because he was bringing understanding. The devil fears light more than he fears anything. Because when you get revelation, your life changes. That treasure is unlocked. So that's what the devil will fight against revelation. Satan will not fight against you going for hands to be laid on you. That one is good. But he will not put up any resistance per se. But when you get understanding of the word, he will fight you. That's why, that's why, you know, sometimes, you know, the things we do to get understanding, he will fight against them. Even now that I'm preaching, he's fighting against it, telling you that it's taking too long. <laughs> so you must tell them that look, you I know you are against understanding. I won't mind you. In Second Timothy 2 7, Paul told Timothy, he said, Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. In all things. We need to pray that God should give us revelation. Understanding. You see, because it's that understanding that will help you to even know the seasons and the times. I'm talking about seasons and times for your own life. The destiny that God has for you, I'm saying that is locked in the spirit. Now, that's why Sometimes, when you get a prophetic word, so you, 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 you know that the word resonates. The prophet is reading from your book. He's reading from your book. The, the book of your destiny, which is in your spirit. That whole book has been deposited in your spirit and he's reading from the book. That's why some people sometimes say that the prophet can only confirm. There are things that the prophet may tell you that you have not heard before. It's not only confirmation. Certain things you have never heard, not because it's not in you, but because you were not sensitive enough. So God will have to send somebody to come and unveil that to you. But you will know that you have been seeing these things in dreams you have been having them, but you didn't believe. Then God will send a confirmation. God speaks to us through the inward witness. If only we will learn to act on what we feel inside. Be led by your heart. Be led by your heart. 
not necessarily your feelings. When I say what you feel inside, not physical feeling, it's a spiritual knowing. And that is one way to unlock. But you see, the more you spend time with God, you will see that that ability increases. The more you walk in love, your discernment increases. Philippians 1 9. That your love may abound more and more unto all discernment. Walking in love opens your eyes. Walking in hatred and unforgiveness closes your eyes. That's why sometimes when you walk in bitterness, you can make wrong choices in life. Yeah. But when you decide to walk in love, you have clear eyes to see. You said that your love may abound more and more unto all discernment. So now, when you set your mind on the spirit, you will start thinking about food, spiritual food. We all know that the food for the spirit is a word. But the food for the spirit is really the rhema. You see, I said God works from inside out. The rhema is the word that God has breathed on, quickened in your spirit. You need to know the written word, which is called the logos. This is a written word called the logos. But the rhema is the word that God has quickened. Sometimes from the written word, that he has quickened. We must read the logos, but pray for rhema. We must read the Bible every day, like the, the man said in the dream to me. Read your Bible every day. But don't just read. Pray for understanding and rhema. And expect God to be speaking to you through what you are reading. Then you will gain understanding. There are certain things you will develop your conviction from a rhema you had from the word. Maybe you are contemplating on doing something or not doing it. It will surprise you that just by reading the Bible and praying for understanding and expecting God to speak to you, God will answer that controversy through a rhema word that he will give you through meditating on the scriptures. And that will unlock the treasures. The logos will teach you, but the rhema will feed you. That's why I said, God does not teach his children. He feeds them. Paul said, when I came to you, I fed you with milk. I fed you. God feeds us. Why? How? He feeds us by the rhema word. So you can pack the logos in your mind and you can have the teaching. But not until you pray for understanding, you will not have the feeding. Because teaching will go to the mind, feeding goes to the heart. And it is the Holy Spirit alone who can open your heart for the feeding to get into your heart. He said, he opened Lydia's heart that he should understand the things that Paul was saying. So Lydia was there with a, with a woman only Lydia's, Lydia was able to receive Paul even into her house. Even though she was there with some woman. It was God who breathed into Peter and Peter saw that you are the Christ. The son of the living God. It wasn't guesswork. Before Peter, four other people had come. One came and said, you are Elijah. How? Why did he say that? Because when I look at you, I look at certain things about you. You look like Elijah. Then I said, no, no. He's like Jeremiah. Look at the way he wept at Lazarus' tomb. Jeremiah was a weeping prophet, so he's Jeremiah. Then somebody said, he's John the Baptist. Remember John said, one is coming after me, mightier than I. And it, it's the same John who has come back to life. What they were using was guesswork, comparison. The one said, oh, he is one of the prophets who, are, who has come back to life. But Peter sought for understanding. And the father said, 
He is the Christ. The son of the living God. And Jesus said, oh, blessed. Blessed are you, Simon Bajona. So, when you receive understanding, you are blessed. He said, because flesh and blood did not reveal, but my father revealed. Because my father revealed, you are blessed. And he said what? And I will give unto you the keys. I will give unto you the keys that will unlock the treasures. Why? You have gotten revelation, understanding. It will open the doors. Open the doors. You know one way to get understanding? Praying in the spirit. Praying in the spirit. Praying in tongues. In fact, I will spend time to talk about tongues some time later. But pray, he said, by you, beloved, building up yourself, Jude verse 20, on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourself in the love and mercy of God. Building up yourself. So praying in the spirit will release the spirit of understanding that will unlock the treasures. So praying in tongues will unlock the treasures. That is, that is, you see, because the soul, who is the agent? The soul is the agent that must go to the spirit and then uh, instruct the body. And sometimes the soul, you know, when you come born again, your soul is not saved yet. That's why I would say, renew your mind. Because he said, renew your mind. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be it transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. When the mind is renewed, that is when the agent can now assess the deposit in the spirit. Because the mind is the leading part of the soul. And when you pray in the spirit, you also empower the soul because the soul, the, 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 the soul is not born again and that's where the flesh is. And the flesh will try to block access to the deposit and praying the spirit will, will suppress the flesh. In Romans 8.13, he said, if you live in the flesh, you will die. But if you through the spirit mortify, put to death the deeds of the flesh, then you can live. So, if you through the spirit, the more you pray in the spirit, the more you are putting to death this of the flesh. Let me tell you, if you are somebody who prays in the spirit, you form the habit of praying in the spirit, you will see that power will be released to suppress the flesh and to release the spirit. He said, if you pray in an unknown tongue, you edify yourself. The word edify is from the word edifice, which means structure. You give structure to the things of the spirit. It's like putting blocks upon blocks, building. It's like building a house, praying in the spirit, singing in the spirit. Fasting does the same thing. It can unlock treasures of wisdom, Pray in the spirit can unlock treasures of wisdom. Revelation. Try reading the Bible whilst praying in tongues. It's very powerful. You can try it. Reading the Bible like New Testament and then praying in tongues. Your understanding will come. You will catch the spirit behind the word. And the word will stick into your heart. Praying in tongues will unlock you see, the blueprints that God has for you. That's one way to open the treasures. Pray in tongues. The blueprint, if, if you want to know God, just pray. Just pray in tongues. Sometimes what I do is I pray then I act. I may not have a clear word or do to do that. I just pray through. You know, there's a prayer you pray and you pray through. 
You know, sometimes we pray, but we don't pray through. You pray and you get to a point where you have a note of victory. Then you stop. Then you come out and you act. And in most cases, you will act right. So I don't even know what you're doing, but you will act right. Why? Because when you were praying, you were praying out mysteries. And these mysteries are keys. Keys of the kingdom to unlock the possession, the treasures. It will strengthen you when you pray in tongues. It will strengthen you for the spirit man to be released. So that you might be strengthened with might in your spirit. In your inner man by his spirit. The praying in tongues strengthens you, gives you, releases might. So if you have not been praying in tongues, start praying in tongues. And you don't need any special time to pray in tongues. You can, you can almost, you, you can pray in tongues and do almost any other thing. Yeah. Because when you pray in tongues, your spirit is speaking mysteries. You are exercising the spirit. In fact, Amplify see when I pray in a known tongue, the Holy Spirit through my spirit prays. Through my spirit prays. And my understanding is not fruitful. Your mind doesn't have any part to play in it. So you are just, your spirit is just communicating with the Holy Spirit. The spirit is bearing witness with the Holy Spirit. And you know what he's saying? He's saying many things, releasing many keys, sometimes giving angels instructions on strategic moves to make on your behalf of, of your destiny. That's why it's important. Because, the, you see, you, the Holy Spirit is in you. The angels of God, they, they say they listen to the voice of God and the voice of his word. So, when the Holy Spirit gives instructions to them, they pick those instructions, then they start acting. Pray in tongues often. Often. The third one is waiting on God. Waiting on God. You know, I talked about um, um, practicing the presence of God. When you listen to the message I preach on the morning watch. Soaking. That is also one way to unlock the treasures. Unlock the treasures. Soaking, waiting on God in solitude. You see, uh, be still and know. It's a knowing, it's a spirit. They that wait upon the Lord shall be, shall, shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up with wings like eagles, you know, so that they can soar and, and, and fly higher altitudes. It's very important. It transforms you. Second Corinthians 3.18 But we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of God as in a mirror are transformed into the same image from glory to glory even not by the Spirit of God. From glory to glory. The same image. How? Beholding. How do you behold? Wait on Him. The more you spend time waiting on God, the more you are being transformed. It's the principle of transfiguration. Transfiguration. The more you are being transformed, the more you are being transformed. It gets to a point where you have, see, you'll be walking in the wisdom of God naturally. Paul said, we have the mind of Christ. It's like, you get to a place, should I go right or go left? You will walk naturally to the right place. Neither right nor left, but the right way. The way. When you do these things, the fruit of the Spirit too is expressed, released. You see, the gifts of the Spirit too, they are released. They are released. You know how to use the gifts. The fourth one is believers fellowship. 
believers fellowship is very important that is one thing that will unlock the treasures in fact sometimes the keys to unlock your treasures are in other people other believers that is why we should not miss believers gathering or we should not be we should not live our lives in such a way that we don't have fellowship with believers like you are not connected when i say fellowship i'm not really talking about a meeting i'm talking about connection he said do not forsake the assembly of yourselves together not really meeting but connection assembling means that like assembling car parts you, are, you see so when the car is there you are the, the fender you are the door you are the steer and they they have to assemble all the parts so as a believer you must always be connected to the body all be connected and that will that will release the treasures that will refresh you in the bible the way the spirit is refreshed is by fellowship let me read some scriptures to you come to first corinthians 16 18. 16 18. It says, For they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. He was talking about uh, Fortunatus and Achaicus and Stephanus and <laughs> all those Greek names. You know, they come to uh, Philemon, the book of Philemon or Philemon, depending on where. You went to school. <laughs> Philemon. Philemon. Verse 7. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Refreshed. Second Corinthians 7.13. The same thing. Paul was talking about refreshment. Refreshment of the spirit from believers. 713. Therefore, we have been comforted in your comfort, and we rejoice exceedingly more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. So refreshment is derived from fellowship. Do you know why Jesus said that we should wash one another's feet? He didn't say we should bath one another. He said, wash their feet. You know why? Because as you go, your feet will gather dust that you did not know of. Yeah. As you walk through the world, sometimes you gather many things. Depression, fear, the things you see, sometimes they put fear around you, you don't even know. Depression. So many things. When you come in the, in the midst of believers, there's a washing. Yeah, there's a washing. Sometimes you will see that when you are alone, when you are alone, you will see that there are certain things that will be so difficult for you. When you come among believers, it will be easy. Even sometimes things you don't understand, you will come on believers that somebody will just say something, and then a light will go on in your mind, just like that. There is Power in fellowshipping with other believers. Real power. Paul said, when you come together, somebody may have a tongue, interpretation, a doctrine, exhortation. Because the life of God is in him or her, is in you. When you meet, you are refreshed. He or she is also refreshed. Amen. Amen. Tell somebody, don't be a lone ranger. Yes. Because it's not good. Be connected. The, the hand is connected to the shoulder. Connection. He said, the body grows by that which every joint supplies. The, the wrist is joined to the hand and this joint will supply life. 
the hand is joined to the, the shoulder and the, this point where it is joined releases life. God can connect you to somebody in the body of Christ and you are going to release life into each other. Very important. The last one, impartation. Impartation can release the treasure. The impartation is aimed at releasing what is in you. It's not bringing something from outside. The, put, the potential is in you. So, when hands are laid on you, you won't say, receive. The receive is not coming from the one who is laying hands on you. What is coming is the power of God to unveil what is on the inside. Release it. Sometimes, giftings embedded in your spirit you didn't know somebody will lay hands then the power of God will just unveil the gifting because every gift that you will need to fulfill your assignment has already been given to you yeah Paul told the Corinthians said you come behind in no gift you see you are full of all gifts you are enriched plutizo, enriched with all gifts it's, it's, it's given. But you need encounters and impartation to release them. Sometimes, let me tell you something. Sometimes, we often see that, okay, I received this impartation from this person. It's wrong. Paul said, I long to see you that I may impart you a spiritual gift to the end that you will be established. It wasn't, not that he's going to impart to them gifts, a spiritual gift, a spiritual substance that you may be established. That substance is the power of God that comes to unlock certain things that are already in you. If you know how God behaves, you will know that when God called you, everything you needed was in you. Look at your physical talents, natural talents. Have you seen anybody who gives another person a talent before? You can't impart a talent. But somebody can train you for your talent to come out. Impartation really is not laying of hands. Listen, impartation really is association, speaking, understanding. That's impartation. Yeah. When hands are laid on you, the target is the spirit. Anointing is not for the body, it's for the spirit. Even when they pour oil on you, the target is the spirit, not the body. So the impartation is coming to release what is in the spirit. God has already given you everything you would need. It's not coming from any man. I'm not saying that you don't need any man to impart. <laughs> I'm saying that what the person is imparting is not that the, what you what you have is already in you. The person is releasing spiritual substance to unravel it. For instance, you were born with certain gifts. You see, the same thing with the natural, the same thing with the spiritual. You were born spiritually with certain gifts. They are in you. These are the tools you will need on your journey. At a point, you may not be conscious of them. You may meet somebody who will speak a word into your life and then those gifts will start manifesting. He did not put the gifts there. He, he spoke a word and the gifts started manifesting. That is impartation. So, impartation really comes, comes through association. Words. Understanding. Even sometimes you will have a dream, you will see somebody, let's say a man of God, coming to you, and the person will come and lay hands on you. And you may think that you got that impartation from the person. It's not the, if it was a person, the person will be aware. <laughs> but when you meet him and you ask him, he will tell you, I don't even know you. God was using that 
to let you know something. Maybe the same line of ministry. You have the same line of ministry. When he was saying that people say that he got his anointing from Catherine Kuhlman, it's not true. He said, I didn't get that anointing from Catherine Kuhlman. So let's change some of the, the, the way we see certain things. Sometimes we think that the, the, the thing is in a man of, God, man of God's hand. That is why do, they can tell you to bring money before I give you a gift. Because you think that he is bringing you something. Of course, he's bringing you something, but that is a spiritual substance you need that will set in motion what God has worked in you. There are gifting that God gave you when you were born again. Do you know when God made you a prophet? Not when a hand was laid on. He said, before, when, when you were in your mother's womb, I ordained you and set you apart as a prophet. Jeremiah was a prophet in the mother's womb. Not when oil was poured on him. I would go say that I laid hands on you and you started prophesying. I gave you the prophetic anointing. Somebody said, I've given you seven angels to work with. And because of what you've done, I've taken six. <laughs> Use the one to eat. <laughs> For Bakun Didi. Let you on our feet. I don't want that kind of impartation. For you to give me angels. <laughs> if only we will mind the spirit. And we will focus on developing the spirit. I'm telling you, we are going to walk in prepared places. You see, you will not miss your way. You will not miss your destiny. You see, you will not miss God's plan for your life. I'm telling you, you will not miss it. You will not miss it. You will not miss it. God will, God will, God will let you know. God, because the thing has already been wet in. All you need to do is work out. Let's begin to pray in the spirit. For the spirit of understanding, revelation, the key to unlock our possessions, the key to possess our possessions, that key is understanding, that key is revelation, that key is a spirit of revelation, understanding. Oh God, give us the spirit of wisdom and understanding. In the knowledge of Jesus, that the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened. You said that you counsel us to buy gold and to buy raiment and to buy eyes salve, that our eyes may be anointed with eyes salve. Grant us illumination, breathe into us, O God, breathe into us, and let the inspiration of the Almighty bring understanding. And help us to walk in our high places because of uh, the understanding that you impart into our spirit. Mande brandi kolobos sete kimra talamahasa koli brotolos mande breketales ko mahataya namasi. We are praying. We are asking God that God should give us the strength. You see, the strength to persist in praying in the Spirit. That we will pray and pray through. That we can pray and pray through. When you pray and you pray through, you hit a certain note of victory. You know that you have prayed through. That's, but we need strength in prayer. Let's ask God. Give us strength to pray. You're able to pray in the spirit. Pray to pray through to, and break through. Makili antele behusi, koli brata la balas, bande brakuzi kis, mante krebetos, ingata ya nezi, lambondo guzi kahata, 
Colibra de Gazigata Hata, Bakian de Bradiris, Colibra Hatiris, Mantolo Bogus, Ribatalias, Lozi Brandi Sukihata, Le Crototos, Vikiriatala Masikaha, Logi Brodoza, Mondatahala, Sidolongoski, Ribine Sinohokaha, Oli Hanta Labahandi Kesegate, Coli Brodosata, Ligalanga Sindolo, Sikotos, Lintolo Mahanta, Mokalimbra Talimbra Tasatia, Riba Tanta Hata, Hoka Tonde Sekete, Malibre de Casandolo Mahose. In the name of Jesus, we are praying this last prayer. We are asking God to give us grace that we will be able to receive from one another, we will be able to receive from our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because sometimes God's manna is hidden in his children. And we must relate with them to get the manna. But we need humility and wisdom. Let's pray that God should give us grace to be able to receive. That we will not miss our blessing by neglecting believers, believers, fellowship, and neglecting receiving from other believers. Sometimes your blessing is in somebody's mouth. Sometimes some, you need a word to quicken something sometimes a piece of advice even prayer will not miss our blessing in the name of jesus in the name of jesus thank you lord we give you praise we give you praise father we thank you we pray with god that you enlighten the eyes of our understanding pray that you release the spirit of understanding wisdom and understanding that let our eyes be open to know you and to know what you have worked into our spirits we pray for strength in our inner man to be able to persist in prayer. And we pray with God for the grace to be able to see our manner, our daily food in people and the humility to be able to assess them. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah.